Rufo Bear sought information for a living. That is to say that ever since he returned from Korea, after having served with the armed forces, he had been working as a private investigator in Montreal. William Hamilton, a rich industrialist, had gotten in touch with him regarding a simple vandalism issue. Nothing to write home about. Not worth hiring a private eye either, just so he can drive for hours on rough roads. But that's how it had always been. The client pays, Carl gets it done. They had set up to meet at the general store, his client's business. Well, actually, the entire village had William Hamilton's name written all over it. When the roads were bad, muddy, or snowed in, it was customary around these parts to close them off. But it was also customary to ignore those signs entirely and drive there anyway. Hamilton never mentioned a road blocking barrier. Why was it needed here in the back of beyond? That would, however, be a mystery for another day. Carl had waited long enough for someone to come and raise it. Still not a soul in sight. There was no point in waiting any longer. Carl had to figure this one out by himself. <phone rings> Hamilton, no doubt, knew who managed the barrier. Carl wanted to give him a call, but that would have been too easy, though as sure enough, the line was acting up. Carl was meeting his client in a store near this area. He was on the right track. Never in his life had Carl thought he would one day drive further north than Shibugamu. Emperor Duplessis, in spite of his conservative agenda, did a good job in colonizing the rural north, which helped to re-establish the region as an integral part of the province of Quebec. The blue fleur de lise could be seen fluttering in the wind here and there, taunting the red Canadian flags on the other side of the province's boundaries. Hamilton is waiting for Carl in the general store. It was time for him to get down to business. Carl, not knowing what lay on the other side of the bridge, needed to make sure he wasn't leaving anything behind. Hamilton enjoyed a lavish country house built in the very heart of the northern forests, not too far from here. 
The local populace was divided when it came to the affluent man. Some saw a wealthy philanthropist dedicated to improving the region's economy. Others an aging Englishman who would do anything to further his fortunes. And those ones hated him enough to go on about scheming against him. Hamilton had recently acquired a few local businesses, but the last straw was the reopening of a mine, which gave rise to a wave of protests and threats from the Cree people. Given these circumstances, Carl reckoned that a good number of people must be feeling compelled to oppose Hamilton in one way or another. So far, only the industrialist's house had been a target, but soon enough, Carl thought, the target would become the man himself. Carl needed to get out of there. The cold and the pain required urgent care. The driver had taken off. It was still best to check it out and leave nothing to chance. Carl needed help. It was a small locked box engraved with the letters WH. Carl thought about taking it. Nothing was to be left to chance. Such heart-wrenching Nordic poetry that was. But Carl didn't care much about flowery language. This deep in the country, his last hope was to find an abandoned garage or a farm by the roadside. His life depended on it. It was so cold, already Carl did not feel his toes anymore. Carl, ever diligent in his work, always carried his log on him, in which he scribbled down thoughts and leads alike during the course of his investigations. Even better than he had hoped, 
Carl Faubert had succeeded once more and was now on his way to new adventures. Spread out on a few acres of untouched forest, bellowing caribou, everlasting snow, and undefiled lakes, the Manistan region was no tourist hub. It was said to have been populated for millennia by Cree people, and ever since the industrial era, by the metal mining industry. The truck was running on fumes. Good thing that the general store was close by. Carl had no trouble recognizing his employer. He had been killed. There was no need to be a detective to figure that out. But only a detective could have noticed that the killer had to have been very close, that the fatal blow had been given before the victim even realized. Carl felt a chill down his spine and had a terrifying realization. If Hamilton was dead, then who was going to pay him? What could be inside that envelope? Carl was taken aback. He knew this address. It was said to be the address of the P.O. box for the Canadian Secret Service. Amateur hunters showing some pride at having killed a nice pelted beast. With men like this roaming the area, wolves would become extinct within 10 years, Carl thought. A nice picture of the Magasin Lachance store, seemingly taken the day it was first open. It feels frozen in time, from an era long forgotten. Jumping from that height was akin to tempting death. Perhaps that man on the snowmobile had seen enough of this world already.
an explosion suddenly occurred outside. Maintaining his composure, Carl recalled something from his military training. Wolves always stay away from populated areas. Wait, was it about bears? Carl was used to strange phenomena, but a chunk of ice like this? As if an iceberg came out of the ground? That was a first. Carl was no electrician, but he could identify a wiring problem when he saw one. Hate was in the air. Seems like some villagers barely tolerated each other. The crowbar was stuck under the lift. Notwithstanding Carl's imposing stature, car lifting wasn't part of his skill set yet. The note explained that the garage and the store couldn't be supplied with electricity at the same time.
At long last, the crowbar was within Carl's grasp. Surely it would come in handy at some point. According to that log, it seemed like the whole village owed some money to the general store. Carl was far more interested in the bunch of nearby addresses he had just gotten his hands on, though. The snowstorm pummeled everything in its path. Carl was not surprised when he heard no tone. Carl knew that Gilles Lachance was in charge of the general store. That made him one of Hamilton's employees. A very angry employee, as Carl could plainly see. Something fell to the bottom of the box. The murder weapon. What was that doing there, Carl wondered. Hamilton must have been determined to keep some information secret to post this key. Shame he got unlucky. Everything made sense now. Poor Hamilton's denunciation was interrupted, and he figured it would be best to lock everything up and send the key to his correspondent, who would receive the box later on. Clever, but not enough. That's what happens to ordinary people playing spy. A milkman had to drive by every week to fill the bottles. The fresh milk indicated a recent visit. knew straight away where to find the infuriated Gilles Lachance. Any good investigation would have to start there.
Carl was beginning to know the store and its surroundings like the back of his hand. The seeker had sought. The Polaroid. Carl's long-standing and faithful ally had seen a share of husbands caught red-handed cheating. There's always something out there waiting to be snapped away. Carl wondered what the hell could that thing be? It looked like a man fossilized in ice. All of a sudden, Carl felt like he was pulled inside a world of dreams, a cold, unknown dimension. Somehow, self-control was slipping from his grasp. To all appearances, this was a hunting law. Better yet, a war diary. What could these engraved numbers mean? A fresh path suddenly appeared before Carl. Carl had that feeling you get when you immerse your frozen hands in hot water. What happened? Now at least he knew who the unfortunate man petrified in ice was. Gilles Lachance, the general store's manager himself. That had to be the worst parking job ever. Who was Carl to judge, though? It may be customary to park like that around these parts, or not. It was so cold, already Carl did not feel his toes anymore.
the air was freezing right down to the bone. The otherworldly ice had struck again. The woman's hopes and dreams were frozen in eternity. That window had seemingly been left open for a while, Carl thought. Given the punishing weather, it couldn't have been intentional. Looks like the holes in that puzzle are there to stay. sensation in his back. Another vision took over him. Something was hidden under the stairs. The man grabbed his rifle. Carl felt a sense of dread in him. their spousal relationship had been cooling down lately. It seemed like secrecy was commonplace in this house. The vision's veil was lifted and he was back to reality. A reality in which Giselle, Jill's loving spouse, was motionless, frozen in ice. What a pleasant activity. Of course, you'll find the record player only to find the records weeks later in some random box. It felt like old people were all these walls could see for years. The Lachances could hardly be blamed for wanting to freshen things up a bit.
What a mess! Clearly, there was some major revamping work underway here. The place looked barely habitable. Beautiful portrait of Gilles and Giselle, bound together by the chains of conventional love. The cross looked after a marriage's well-being and served as a motivator to uphold the priest's sermons calling for more little worshippers on one hand and cautioning against guilty pleasures on the other. Indeed, the Lachances were still part of the God-fearing generation. Many boxes scattered about. Carl didn't need to summon his detective training to quickly figure that the Lachances had just moved in. A nice white coating would restore the room to its charm of olden days. Many boxes scattered about. Carl didn't need to summon his detective training to quickly figure that the Lachances had just moved in. The general store, along with several more infrastructures in the area, had been acquired by wealthy industrialist William J. Hamilton. Perhaps the village should be rechristened Hamiltown. Carl had seen that kind of safe before, with its double-layered security system blending letters and numbers, its code couldn't be broken by the common burglar. The pot was cold, and the stew inside wasn't cooked. It's likely that poor Giselle was slow cooking it before she got snapped. What a waste. The pot was cold, and the stew inside wasn't cooked. It's likely that poor Giselle was slow cooking it before she got snapped. What a waste. 